Good morning, everybody. You can, we'll give everybody a second to find their way to a seat. That's all I'm saying. Dr. I did, um, I did prepare a, a handout for the benefit of those who want to try to follow along. Hopefully I'll stay on script a little bit. Well, good morning. It's, it's a, a beautiful day. We're all here together. Uh, we have a risen Lord and Savior, and we're so thankful. I have so much to be thankful for. There is um, just a great deal of comfort in, in seeing everybody's faces and, and sharing this experience together to, to gather to worship uh, on this day. And um, it's a, a lot of sentimentality that, that's kind of, I'm feeling a little bit right now as a, uh, just a, a church family and, uh, and this body. And, and, and we'll actually get to talk about that a little bit. And maybe it's through preparation that um, maybe I'm tuned into that a little bit more today. But it's certainly a wonderful day to worship. Uh, and we are, again, much to be thankful for. Let me open in prayer and we'll get started. Father, we are grateful and we rejoice together on this great day, this day where we celebrate like every day we celebrate but today in particular uh, that Jesus is risen and that he's conquered death and the grave and sin and we are saved and uh, Lord we are thankful for our church and our, our people and uh, we pray today that our worship will bring you glory and that our time together will uh, allow us to learn more about you and that we will draw things from your word that that you would uh, hope that we would hear, want us to hear, and, and that we would, um, again, we would bring you glory through our day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll be continuing with our study today, uh, the book, The Communion of Saints. And um, it is, uh, it's been a, a great study. Uh, it is edited by Philip Graham Riken. And uh, this may have been explained to you already, but just for the sake of review, uh, this particular book was uh, just developed as a, a curriculum for an adult Bible study uh, for 10th Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia. And so it has numerous authors, and, uh, but Riken pulled it all together, and so we've been enjoying this time together. In case any of you have not been here, I know uh, on Easter Sunday in particular, it, it's not unlikely that we might have some family members or guests accompanying people. I wanted to back up just one little bit before we charge into today's content and just review maybe uh, one of the more fundamental parts of what we're discussing, and that is specifically what is the communion of saints, just so we, we have that uh, established together again. So we're going all the way back to chapter one here for a moment, but just as a reminder for most of you, um, Riken says that the communion of saints are literally the holy ones. Now, they are not holy because of their own virtue, their own acts or deeds, uh, or any of their own merits. They are holy uh, solely on the basis of their justification through the righteousness uh, Im imbued through Jesus Christ. And uh, so not only are they declared holy due to their justification in Christ, but they are made holy through sanctification by the Holy Spirit as they, uh, as we learn to uh, resist sin more, more frequently and as we learn to be more obedient to Christ in our, in our growth. And we are also identified as saints and as being holy because we are set apart. We are uh, separated from the world. We are distinct and we are meant to be different. We are meant to be um, uh, identifiable as, as God's people. And as we consider what is communion, well, just the simple definition there is that, that communion for us is our unification together in a common life in Jesus Christ. So, all that review set aside. Um, hopefully it gets everybody kind of caught up with that. But we will turn to, the, to my particular chapter that I've been uh, preparing for, which is chapter 6 in this book. Um, and it is actually a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Hughes Oliphant who wrote this particular chapter. 
and he was uh, with Princeton's Center for Theological Inquiry. And his focus uh, is, we'll, we'll get to, but the title is catchy, and some of these titles in this book have been, uh, but it's Assembly Required, Assembly Required. Um, which, okay, we'll put the question out there, just kind of get everybody talking and thinking and participating a little bit. Um, what do you think of when you hear assembly required? Jeff. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Having to put together uh, what he's... Right. Yes, exactly. And that's an important thing. But uh, so, yes, I mean, that was where my, went, my mind went eventually uh, or immediately to is, uh, you know, putting together something Christmas Eve, trying to have something special ready. Uh, now, I know I'm, I'm, I'm sort of blending uh, significant Christian holidays, but, um, you know, maybe it's trying to snap together those little plastic eggs. But, um, and yes, but, the, but putting together a bike, for example, uh, we've all opted to do that. I think we've all learned that it's worth the hundred bucks to let Target do it for you. Um, because invariably you do end up with something missing or an extra part that you know is supposed to go somewhere and your concern is it's not gonna work right, you know? Um, and obviously when you think about that, when you think about how uh, these things are meant to go together, um, well, you know, bringing it back into, into relevant commentary, uh, we think about the body of Christ, right? And um, you would no more want to hand your child a wheel and say, hey, here's a bike, I mean, it rolls, you know, um, than you know, we, we are to um, believe that we can operate as individuals, that we can be kind of lone wolves as, as believers operating outside of a communion of saints. And that's, that brings us back to this notion of assembly required. And so we'll, we'll speak about that now. Um, so Romans 12.5 says, So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And we are called to be a communion of saints. We are a body of Christ, and we are called to gather together. We are called to assemble. So question again, why is it important that we assemble? These, are, these would be Sunday school answers. So it is Sunday school. So why, why is it important that we, as a body of believers, assemble? Commanded Sorry? Commanded it's, co- well, it's commanded in Scripture. Yeah, there you go. I didn't know if you were standing up to talk, Joe. Uh, they're the mic man. All right. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Uh, could avoid heresy. Well, that's an interesting point, Lynn. And we'll actually touch on that uh, in a little bit. So, yeah, hold on to that thought. I like that. What else? To be an encouragement to one another. That's right. That's right. What else? Well, there are many good reasons, of course. Um, so we'll start talking about them. <coughs> Oliphant directs us right to the Westminster Confession. And uh, so I'll read, you, I'll read you the modern version of the Westminster Confession. Confession. This is 26.2 from the Westminster Confession. It is the duty of professing saints to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in performing such other spiritual services as to help them to edify one another. It is their duty also to come to the aid of one another in material things according to their various abilities and necessities. As God affords opportunity, this communion is to be extended to all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. So as we just read, part of our profession as Christians is to maintain fellowship and communion in all that we do have and are. And we are, we are called in that, in that particular passage to invest in each other's lives, right? Uh, we are bound to maintain a holy fellowship and holy communion both with God and with each other. And so we see this in many examples and uh, from the earliest days of the church, the Christian church, there have always been those who have gathered in worship and in fellowship. So I'm going to read this particular passage several times because the context is going to... Uh, call for it, but 
from Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 42, the early church. Uh, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. So, in fact, the, the faithful worship of God's people and the eagerness to be taught, taught God's ways so they can walk in his paths, provide fulfillment of even a divine prophecy. From Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, and this is, uh, this is indicating a time when the Gentiles from different religions of the world will be brought in uh, to the Christian fold. Isaiah 2, 3, And many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. So many Christians will testify that our fellowship and our worship is a foretaste of heaven, right? Um, we are communing with the triune God. We are communing with each other. And it's a foretaste of, of heaven. But yet, there are many people who elect to not assemble. Now, we're here. We're, we're, we're not those people. Um, now, it is Easter, so yeah, maybe more people are going to show up than might usually. But um, there are people out there who believe that the requirement to assemble or even be a part of a church is not essential. Um, why do you think that is? What are some reasons that people may give? And some of them are understandable. Some of them are, are, you know, could be justifiable, you know, health and uh, circumstances. But what are some reasons you might hear from someone who says, I don't really need to go to church? They may even be a professing Christian. Now you've got to answer. <laughs> I just saw a young woman one time, it's probably been three years ago, and I just commented because I'd known her when she was young. I was like, well, where are you attending church? And she went, my relationship with Jesus is personal. I do it on my own. I don't need to go to church. Right, right. Yeah, that's, so a, that's, that's a common. Quote. Right. Anybody else? What other reasons do we hear? And there's a lot of reasons. Yes. Debbie Walker. Yeah. Um, a lot of people feel that it's more like an institution mm. because right. of the offerings and wanting this, you know, raising money kind of situation. Right. So. Sure, sure. Anything else? Any other thoughts about it? There's a lot of these. Um, this, yes, go ahead. Lynn, Lynn's got her hand up. Yes. Thank you, Joe, for doing this. I've heard a lot of people say that the church is just full of hypocrites, and, and I just generally say, well, you fit right in. <laughs> and you're, if you're right. You know, we all fail. We all sin, so you're right. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, that's, um, that's common. People who, they want to use some sort of beef they have with the church as their, their excuse or their justification to stay away, right? Um, you know, there's several others you could think of. I think there's fear. I think fear is a, is, is a common one. I think particularly in the post-COVID well, COVID era anyway, I think there's a lot of people that are fearful. I think, um, you know, you could look at, and you mentioned this a moment ago, Lynn, um, heretical teachings. I think there's a, social media has blown up the world with lots of uh, different ways of trying to, you know, contort and twist your, your own Christian viewpoint to suit the way you want to be able to sleep in on Sunday morning or have your own personal uh, journey or uh, you know, find meaning in, in things that are different than, than a communion of saints and in, in worship. Uh, so so there's, a, there's too much of that, a preponderance of that. Um, convenience, laziness, um, you know, there's, there's a million different reasons why people would give as an excuse. Um, and sometimes, sometimes people have legitimate reasons that they can't be there, but as we'll see in, in some of our, um, our content that we'll get to, you know, there, there are provisions in Scripture to be able to accommodate. That's the role of, of, of the communion of saints. Um, we are warned 
by Scripture not to fall into that trap of neglecting to gather together as a communion of saints. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So a couple of interesting things. This has been a problem within the church since the church, right? But uh, I think an interesting thing to draw a circle around, and I think we probably would resonate with this just a little bit, but the all the more as you see the day draw near. You know, I, think, I think that's sunk in to me in an, in an interesting way because you know, that tells me um, as we observe things and as we, as we are, are continuing to be sanctified, you know, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna spend more and more time together as a, as a communion of saints, right? Um, as we observe things that are happening in the world. <clears throat> and uh, and I, that's, I think that's interesting that, that that's always been uh, that notion. Uh, but yeah, the Word of God actively warns us against neglecting to gather. So by emphasizing fellowship, the Westminster Confession picks up on uh, the basic biblical teaching that, about Christian worship. And so let's read that again from Acts about the early church. And we'll start to pull some things out. <clears throat> and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Okay, so what are the things that the early church did when they gathered together? They, they had a meal together, yeah, the breaking of bread, right, there you go. In order, teaching and preaching of the word, of the gospels. What is simply called the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and prayer. So, the second term in, in my list as I ordered them was the, the fellowship. And this, the fellowship, as we learned a couple chapters back, or last chapter, is the, is, uh, the Greek word for this is koinonia. Um, and it's a biblical term that underlines the doctrine of the communion of saints. And it is sometimes translated as communion or sharing, but however it's translated, it expresses a very important biblical concept that God's glory is served by the fellowship of Christians and the communion of saints. So what happens when we gather together as a communion of saints. What happens? God is present. Yes, thank you. What else? We can join together in common prayer. Very good. Yes. Hear and absorb the teaching of Scripture. Bear each other's burdens, yes. Big one. You ready for the God is worshipped in spirit and truth. But yeah, we, we're united together in our love for one another, right? When we gather together, we build relationships and we're united through our life in Christ together. We are at one in our faith. It's not a personal journey. This is... This is uh, our edification is we are, we are growing together and we share spiritual and material goods with one another and God is worshipped in spirit and truth and koinonia encompasses all of this. <clears throat> so to demonstrate a lot of this and there will be a couple of sizable chunks of scripture so, uh, so hang in there with me on this but Oliphant takes us back uh, to some uh, Old Testament examples of the communion of saints or the gathering together of God's people and points out what that was about, what it was like, why it mattered. And it's really interesting. There's some really interesting parallels. Uh, so we're going to go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24 recounts the earliest 
recorded service of public worship in the Bible. And it makes it clear that the communion of saints is the essence of Christian worship. So, uh, reading from Exodus 24. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld, ate, and drank. So, several noteworthy things that we can pull from this particular passage. Moses wrote down the words that God had spoken to him. Then he read the law to the people, and they promised to obey. The people responded to God's word. Okay? We notice there are certain rites that are practiced. The rite of of sprinkling, rite, R-I-T-E, rite of sprinkling. So half of the blood was sprinkled on the people, which indicated a strong unity, a blood bond tied together with a blood bond in unity, and half was sprinkled on the altar, which symbolically is sprinkling it on God, and that's indicating a blood covenant relationship between God and his people. And finally, a covenant meal was shared on top of the mountain. Oliphant makes the point through this that unity is established um, among those who share a meal. And there are examples throughout the Bible, of course, and you've heard some of them. So Exodus gives us a clear picture of what worship is supposed to be. Worship is supposed to be communion. And the saints enter into a sacred communion with each other and God uh, through worship. So, as we saw demonstrated in this passage, there are a number of things that that happen um, that that involve activities that do unify the saints. The book of the covenant is read, vows are made, and to follow the teaching, right? People are sprinkled with the blood of the covenant, and a meal is shared to seal the covenant relationship. Seeing a pattern, right? We're seeing this pattern. Um, so, again, this is how Oliphant demonstrates that the church is supposed to experience the communion of saints. He gives us another interesting episode. This is when Nehemiah, um, well, the, the Israelites have been allowed back into Jerusalem after Babylonian uh, uh, well, captivity, but they had been scattered about under Nebuchadnezzar. Now they're allowed back in. They've rebuilt the wall, and the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to establish an assembly, a gathering of God's people, and it's going to be a time of worship and fellowship. So, reading from Nehemiah, chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And this is loads of people. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the Lord before the assembly, the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now listen as Nehemiah provides a great deal of detail um, about describing the setting of this worship. And there are a lot of names, big names, hard names to say. So so I apologize, (laughs) Um, but I'm going to do it. Uh, So, and Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform 
that they made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Padeah, if I've said any of these wrong, don't say anything. <laughs> Padeah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashum, Ashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshullam on his left hand. This is his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And he opened it, and the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Reading further. Also, more names. Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebathai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Zariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peleah, and the Levites. Well, these are the Levites. Helped the people understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So, not only is the law read, but you have the Levites who were, had leadership in the Jewish church who were wandering around this, this mob, this gathering of people, providing uh, interpretation, guidance, teaching of what they were hearing. So not only are they having the law read, they're having it taught to them. And the Levites were the descendants of Levi, uh, the third son of Jacob and Leah, and they were... Um, they would sing song, psalms during the worship. They maintained the temple. They had a lot of duties as, uh, as religious leaders. Um, they served as teachers and judges. But in this instance, they were wandering about, making sure everybody understood what was being read. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the word of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and, to, and send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So this is a beautiful picture to me of you know, the God's people had been scattered in exile and they return and they sit under the reading of the word and their reaction, their response is to weep. And uh, it's, uh, it's just fantastic. So um, there are some, several important things about this uh, that I think are noteworthy. Who, who was included in this, in this assembly? Men, women, children, everybody. Everybody was there. Anybody who could hear and understand. It was, uh, so that was noteworthy. Who else was present? All those names on the stage, on the platform, right? We won't name them again. I'm not going to say them again. But uh, they, they were elders. They had elders that were present. They had uh, the Levites. Levites were present. Um, so important, that's important to say because um, this assembly had structure. This assembly had organization to it. It was, it was purposeful. It was official. You know, it wasn't just a, hey, we're here, what do we do? Um, it was an official assembly. They, they built a platform from which the word of God could be, could be read. Um, so what was the main event at this assembly? What was the main thing that, they, that happened? The reading of the law. Yes, it was. Thank you. So yeah, the reading of God's word. That was the main event. That was the main. And this went on for days. It, was, it took all morning long, every day for a week. They sat under the reading of the law and they would weep because of the word. So not only was the, was the word of the law read to them, it was explained to them. So they were receiving teaching. And the passage shows that this community was being reconstituted through the hearing, reading, and preaching of God's word. So there were also certain rites, R-I-T-E-S, and traditions associated with the occasion, which mark it as a service of worship. Um, and I thought that was interesting too. So it's, it's an activity that's defined differently. The word was elevated 
which we, we do here. Um, and this is it was by a scroll that would be read. Uh, people responded to the reading of the word. They would shout, Amen, Amen. And what concluded the reading and the preaching? What did they do at the end? Look for the pattern. What was, what's been the pattern? They had a meal. They had a feast. Thank you, Debbie. Yes, that's correct. So the book of the law is solemnly read. The people respond. A meal is shared and a covenant renewal is performed. So it's fantastic stuff. So rabbinic tradition counts that the assembly at the Watergate here was the first official synagogue event. <clears throat> but um, it's what's described in the Westminster Confession when it says that the saints are bound to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God. So worship is an experiencing of the covenantal community and a realization of the communion of saints. So let's talk about communion in the church. Communion of the saints in the church. So like worship on the mountain with Moses or in the city with Nehemiah, Worship in the church is a communion of saints, right? It follows the same pattern of covenant, covenant worship God first established through Moses and Nehemiah. Here's that passage from Acts again, so check it, uh, check it out. You'll see the connection and parallels. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. So, I'm doing okay on time, checking. So the first Christians understood that within their community, uh, covenant assembly is required. And as they uh, convened, as they met, they would spend time in corporate prayer, brand, uh, corporate learning of biblical truth, corporate evangelism, and corporate Christian growth and maturity. And the necessity for gathering and fellowship and worshiping is repeated constantly, of course, throughout the New Testament as well, even with Jesus um, in Luke. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. So throughout the Old Testament, the saints are called to meet and to commune and to assemble. So... Oliphant concludes his, his chapter with a great quote from uh, Puritan Robert Harris. Especially apply yourselves to the communion of saints. A dead coal put to live coals will take fire from them, which it would never do lying in the dead heap. So here, sort yourselves with such as are godly and frequent the ordinances, preaching, prayer, and the sacraments that you may have part in the new covenant. So let's stop here and see if anybody has any thoughts stirring um, before I do one other little thing. But what, else, what, what do you think? What do you, what do you think about it? Are you seeing the pattern? Do you recognize this pattern? Does it make sense? That we, from the very beginning, uh, God has called us to be a communion of saints, not individual believers out doing their own thing. But to gather together, yes. Uh, with the electronic communications that we have today, you could almost fool yourself, be at home on the computer, and be a community. I think the physical presence is very important for us to have and to be together in one place. Yeah, I think that's great. And I was about to tag the question on before you answer it yourself. Does that count? I mean, does that, is that really a suitable gathering digitally, right? But yeah, I agree. I mean, we're, we're meant to be together, to, to really commune and live together and share in our lives. And I think, you know, sitting behind a monitor is, not, is definitely not the same. Or, you know, a phone, whatever it would be, right? What else? What other thoughts? Anybody have any, any more, any, any thoughts? Denise. Uh, 
I was just going to um, repeat something that Mike has taught us before about gathering for worship and that um, what we do weekly throughout our lives as believers is um, in part a rehearsal for what our real life will be in heaven. So who will we be with? We will be gathered before the face of God and who will be in our company, the company of the redeemed. And so, and, and that those are the people through the ages. Mm. But here on earth, um, at this time, you know, we gather together here as the company of the redeemed, but we're rehearsing for what will be happening in eternity. And it will be a lot of what you mentioned also, breaking of bread yeah. and um, fellowshipping, but, but in God's presence and without some really important things, and that is suffering and grief and pain and the stain of sin. Um, so I think that's an extraordinary thought, and it's very comforting, and um, it makes it such a privilege to be here with all of you every week. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great, great way of putting it, Denise. You're, you're right. Um, he's not here. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and use him as a, as a little example. But yeah, we had a, we, we were paid a visit yesterday by Joe and Judy Pikes, and, which is always so much joy and fun, right? And there was just this one special moment where Joe, Joe stands up and just being Joe, and he just says, he goes, you know, tomorrow is the day that we get to celebrate. And I said, yeah, you're right, Joe, you're right. And he said, I just think about all those guys that didn't know the end of the story yet. And I'm so thankful that we know it. And I was just like, you know, it, that's the, it, I, I was in the middle of preparation, of course. And so it just dials right into my head. I'm like, man, this is it. This is what it's about. And, you know, and this, is, you know, this isn't just happening while we're bumping in the hallway together at, at church, right? I mean, this is, this is, you know, living lives together, sharing lives. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful experience in a moment. Uh, there with Joe, so y'all can give him a little pat on the back or something later because he he may he'll probably see it online now. But anyway, uh, yes, we had somebody else had a yes. Um, I was just going to say that I just noticed in that pattern was they went from weeping to rejoicing, mm. and um, I just feel like every week when we come, it's you know you're bringing in all your cares and things that have you failed at or you've done you know not done that you wish you had or whatever and then you realize you know how much God loves us and how yeah. much he is um, so that is the same pattern and then the disciples went from weeping to rejoicing so it's this same pattern every week oh yeah oh that's great absolutely so there, there are a couple of things I want to add, and we can come back to some comments, but I, I don't want to miss the chance to thread this in. So this goes, I'm, I'm, I'm crossing streams here a little bit, uh, so um, just to make you aware. But um, outside of this particular book, and there's just providentially, there are a handful of us that are, that are studying a different book, How Jesus Runs the Church. And this is written by um, Guy Prentice Waters, who's a, a professor at the Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson. Um, but he, and, and this also dials back to something Jeff taught a couple weeks ago, members only, um, about membership. And, uh, but, but really, it speaks to membership and active participation and assembly and, and gathering with the communion of saints. So I wanted to buzz through these because as we reviewed these this past week, I thought, that's, that's the best pure gold stuff. And I got I to gotta tell this. So, um, so, so when we think about this idea, and, and it also kind of hits at a little, a little practical uh, application. So as we think about this idea of whether assembly is necessary um, as, as Christians, these are some things to be reminded of. Remember the Great Commission, okay? The Great Commission, you know, go and make disciples. We're not, we're not just con making converts, right? The idea of the church, the, the idea of us gathering together is to make disciples. So you know, Christian growth and development, right? We can't... Uh, we, we can't overlook that. And so that doesn't happen outside of the organized, gathered church where the word is preached, where people profess faith, and where they go into assemblies ruled by Christ, right? Um, 
a second item, and I'm buzzing through these, I'm sorry. But the New Testament is constantly instructing people given that uh, the, it assumes that, that people are plugged into a church, an active body of believers. A um, handful of verses here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem you highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So it assumes an organizational gathering uh, where there are people who are responsible for you. Um, Colossians 3, 13. Bearing with one another. You're together. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also forgive. It assumes we're together. It assumes because we're together we might have conflict. And it prescribes manners in which to deal with that conflict. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing you, admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. So these are collective activities. Um, not uh, individual journeys, right? So uh, Paul's writings to the church indicate that it's a body of believers, a communion of saints, and they have commitments and obligations to each other. Sorry to be so fast. I'm trying to get it in there. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper assumes church membership. You can't take, take part in communion apart from assembly and worship. The cup, this, the cup of blessing that we bless it is not a participation, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are of one body, for we all partake of one bread. Uh, pastoral care requires participation in membership and to be a part of an assembly. Those who are to give an account of, for your souls are, they can't take care of you if you're not here. They can't provide you spiritual uh, discipline and growth, uh, they can't lead you, they can't know you, uh, you're, you are cut off from, from, those, from those opportunities. Um, and finally, and this is a, a, an epic passage of scripture that I think kind of goes back to the Communion of Saints book, really pulls it all together in a really great way, and that's part of why I wanted to load it up here. But Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to future manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So that was, that's the communion of saints, right? That just sort of nails it. And um, that's the perfect place where I'd like to sort of set it down and, 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 and say, say uh, if there's any questions, that will be fine, <laughs> or comments, I'll be happy to receive them. We're probably getting close to time. We've got two minutes, so if you got something, I'm happy to, happy to answer a question or try or uh, receive any comments. It was a beautiful day and, and a glorious day, so um, can't wait to worship with you. And, um, and I hope that your families are all blessed and uh, enjoy themselves today as well. So thank you. We'll